Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Grittiest Takes. I'm here with, of course, Joe Pork. First off, Joe, how are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. Um, the Flyers are finally coming off of a win instead of a loss, so that's always uh, helpful. So uh, hopefully they can continue as we're recording this podcast going into Buffalo as we're recording this on the Monday before they play the first game in Buffalo. So hopefully they can continue some success heading uh, into playing, uh, bu- or not playing um, in Buffalo, but playing Buffalo rather. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a a series you're going to have to take, especially if you want to climb back into the uh, playoff spot. Obviously, it's been a, a tale of two seasons, and I know it's been a little while since we've done a Flyers episode. So why don't why don't you first kind of just touch on what, what do you think has been the biggest switch for this team from when well, no, we it see... isn't Buffalo. I had that right first. Yeah, it is in Buffalo. I was right. Yeah, this isn't this isn't in Philly. I was looking over. I'm like, that is not Wells Fargo Center. Yeah, no, this was I was <laughs> right. This is Buffalo. Yeah. But hey, why don't you just kind of touch on like what what has been the biggest difference in your eyes since the Flyers were have been on that I guess have been on that run? Because obviously at some point in the season we were thinking, okay, this could really be a Stanley Cup kind of run team and now you're looking at not even making the playoffs so why don't you tell us what has been the biggest uh, difference for this tale of two seasons so far um i think it's you were being able to win through a lot of uh, flaws and issues early on because everybody was together you were still having the top lines mainly perform early on and get it done um now it's differently constructed top lines but what they were back then were performing um, where now the defense is completely exposed because after the COVID hit, uh, you didn't really see Sanheim and Myers have both been having their biggest struggling seasons. Their inconsistencies really came to boot after the um, trying to come back from the COVID spree where um, Ghost, um, I know they sat him a bit for his defense. I didn't necessarily agree with that because Gus is even worse at defense. Uh, Morin and Ghost is a line that people said that could be a line coming up um, a couple years ago now would have been like 2018 since that was the last injury Morin had before being fully healthy. But that could have been the line of the future if Morin stayed healthy because he's the defensive defenseman. He would allow Ghost to kind of do his thing. That looks good in two games uh, thus far. So I think um, it's the defense. Their defense after this COVID, uh, the bout they had, Uh, hasn't come back strong some teams have come back it's not an excuse they can use and the team even said that because other teams have come back in the league strong and then some teams haven't so there has to be a reason why some team have come back with not not necessarily strong but at least tempered like actually doing decent when they came back around more of 500 and then working their way up where the flyers have really struggled and really went on a downturn so i think it's the time away, they were able to find ways to consistently fight through their flaws. From that time away, they couldn't figure out how to fight through games they really shouldn't have won. Because a lot of the games they won early in the season, they were outshot by 20. And then they started out shooting teams and were losing. So it's all about a balance of figuring out in the middle what game style you have to play to be able to win but actually have the stats that are sustainable to win. Because when they were winning early in the season, they had no sustainable stats to keep winning, other than the face-off dot. But other than that, they had no sustainable stats because it's not like their power play was hitting on all cylinders or their PK was hitting on all cylinders. It was just they were finding ways to somehow win, where I think now this team needs to figure out how to bring the defense into – Honus, where I don't know how they haven't figured this out yet, but this is probably a line of the future um, rather than a line of the present, the Myers and Sandheim line, which people thought would be a line of the future. I don't know why they still keep keeping it together now. It's actually happy birthday, Travis Sandheim. Um, <laughs> looking at this is Travis Sandheim's birthday, who just turned 25. But at 24 and 25, they shouldn't be together because both are still working out kinks in their career, and they're both on the same line. You should separate that. Braun's looking good with Provy, but 
if you're telling me that a guy that's 34 going on 35 that has looked great for us at times this year, and Braun, who's been a, one of our better great defensemen with Provy, second to him, um, could be with Provy, Meyer should be able to because he's younger, moves more fluently, obviously, and then try to see if Sandheim and Braun, because Braun has helped to settle down Provorov's game, which was a little bit more frisky, like, like all over the place this year compared to being the regular Provy. He should be able to do that with Myers, or not Myers, with Sandheim. And then Myers actually in a couple games recently has started to look better where Sandheim is still kind of in between. I would try to see if Braun can kind of settle him down like it seems like he's done with Provy because that's what Braun's good for. He's the veteran that can kind of be that veteran aide on a line for a young defenseman, I think you need to put him with Sanheim to try to get him at his best now because your defensive play is clearly the biggest reason why you're blowing all these games and not winning these games and losing to inferior opponents when you have one of the tougher schedules in April. Uh, you had one of the pretty mediocre schedules in March other than when you played Washington and the Islanders you should have been able to, because when we played Pittsburgh, it was still before Pittsburgh really went on their complete tear. That was at the beginning of the month. You should have been able to find more ways to take advantage of some of these teams, and you just couldn't do that. And it's not just the defense's defense. It's like the coaching staff talked about. A lot of these forwards, Kevin Hayes might be producing offensively this year, but his defense sucks. Like, he, he hasn't been what he, he – last year he was a guy that people thought would be top 10 in Selkie. This year, he should probably is bottom 20 in the selfie hood. So, like, his defense has been non-existent. Patrick has an excuse because he's still working back from a major injury. Uh, Lott's defense was good, then sucked in the bad stretch, and now is starting to come back. So, hopefully that continues. The only guys whose defense has been consistent for this team from season's beginning are surprisingly JVR because he's not known for his defense. Coots and then Faraby. And then Giroux's been scoring, but until recently, he wasn't, I wouldn't say, consistent defensively. Where he's actually been a guy that's been trying to lead by example. I just think in words, he has to be a little bit more serious. A lot of his quotes seem too tempered to me to be the captain, where we saw Ghost quote, which I can't repeat on this podcast, but we saw his quote that was a lot more emphatic about how bad the team's playing. That's how a captain should speak not a guy that's not even in the system. Yeah, but you don't know how people speak behind doors and stuff. I get that. That's the case. That's why sometimes I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, it's just this year, you can't come out to the media and talk about luck. Like bad bounces, bounces, and this. That works if it's your first week of struggling. You've been struggling in the whole month of March. Yeah, for about a you, month now. Yeah, that, that's why that doesn't work. If you say that early on, that's one thing. Now what Ghost is saying is pretty much exactly how it is. Like, it's unacceptable when you're hanging out the defense from the forwards to the defense has been hanging out whoever's in net to dry. Yeah. So it's unfair to the goalies, like you said. Oh, no, you're not wrong. And, and, I, and I agree. I think the biggest problem right now for this team has been the defense. I, I think that's where they got to clean it up, and it's a shame because everyone's going to start, like, and not start, they already have, really, is attacking Carter Hart and Brian Elliott. And and for me, it's hard to just say, okay, it's going to have this two completely different. Like, if it was one of them struggling, I think you could use, okay, yeah, he's having a really bad year. But it's both struggling extremely bad compared to what they both did last year. So fantastic. That's why I think I put a lot well, of And Elliott at the beginning of this year because Moose was really good at the beginning yeah. of this year until recently – a couple last games his stats have went down, which I feel is more the defense. because of the defense than uh, his own doing. But yeah. That's why I think it's going to be interesting to see where they go with this and and everything. And obviously, like you said, there's been really no consistency outside a few guys here and there, not even guys that are true defenders. So you're obviously scratching your head trying to find spots there for him. Uh, so that's why yeah. I, I think – you're ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think this team, it just reveals you need to trade for another veteran that can play log minutes. That's why I think um, when it comes to defense, their best bet, I talked about this on other podcasts, would be Jomerson because he doesn't screw your expansion. 
first, I thought Ekholm would be the best guy, but Ekholm screws the expansion draft because he has next year on his contract. You you have to lose somebody else that you can protect. If you bring in Jomerson, he just says this year he has three Stanley Cups. He's basically the new Niskanen that has all that experience, even more so than Niskanen, uh, since he's won three Cups and can kind of help mend together a dysfunctional defense right now where – we saw a guy like Muzzin do that. It took him time, but we saw him do that. And I think it would be wise if you get a Jomerson when you have a guy as a free agent. Seattle has the first chance to contend with some free agents, but I don't think they're going to sign Jomerson because he's still valued at probably 4-6 to up if he plays like he is this year defensively. Okay. So I don't think they're going to spend that much on their first free agent, unless if it's like a scorer. That's different, but as a defensive defenseman, I don't see that. Uh, you bringing him in, that's exactly what you need. More in starting to look good. If you have Jomerson and sign him to, say, a two-year extension after you bring him in, that would make this defense not be fixed, but look a lot better. And then you would just have to see moving forward who's maybe the other guy you bring in in the offseason that then replaces Justin Braun's spot so Braun – next year becomes probably your 6-7 in the final year of his deal rather than a guy that consistently plays like 20 minutes or more a night. And that's why I was going to ask you, like, and you mentioned for defenseman and stuff, I mean, we're 20, or, excuse me, we're 14 days away from the trade deadline. What do you see this team? Like, do you see them being buyers to try to help the defense and still try to make that run? Do you see them being sellers? And what do you think they should do? Well, Fletcher already said they're not going to be sellers unless if something changes since his last press conference. Um, well, I can't I lose think <laughs> Yeah, I think they'll be in between at best. Um, but I feel like if you have to bring in people that are good for now and good for the future, which is why I gave the example of Nicholas Jomerson, because I think he's good for now. He's a free agent. I don't see Seattle grabbing him in that capacity. You can re-sign him for a two-year deal. He has cup experience. Muzzin, when he first went into Toronto, did not fix their dysfunctional defense in a snap of a finger when they first brought him in. It took him to the to the next season. And then, so, I mean, I think if you keep Jomerson, it'll make it look better this year, but not fix it. Going into the next season, it'll start to fix it better if Morin stays healthy, keeps developing into this defensive defenseman anchor. Um, even though he scored the other day, uh, congratulations him for his first goal. That's not his game. He's the defensive defenseman you want with a Jomerson. That just makes your defense look that much better. Braun can be in wherever he fits, uh, rest some of the young guys if they're struggling, or you, and then you have him as an extra defenseman. Uh, who's playing really well this season, but is still getting overplayed, which is why he makes some mistakes at times that people, including myself at times, overly knock him for because he's overexposed. You shouldn't be playing Justin Braun almost 20 minutes a night at this point of his career. You should have somebody else that logs that part of the time. It's just the way it is. That's not the point of his career he's at. And I think the Flyers need to bring in someone, and Jomerson would be my first guy for that. If you want to bring in two guys, you might as well go to Arizona and see how much it would take to get both of their guys. Because if you want to bring in a righty that's a little bit younger um, in Jason Demers, uh, you could also do that. And he's a defenseman coming from the right side um, that is a more of a defensive defenseman that does some of the same things as Braun but just is a little bit quicker on his feet where Braun's not as fluent, where Braun can then play maybe more down lines where he's more accustomed to at this point of his career when he's in the lineup. You can kind of have a Demers play with a Sanheim or a Provy, and then you would have Jomerson play with whoever uh, Demers doesn't play with because I think this team could use a good defensive shakeup to kind of get their defense going, and that would give it more of a defensive shakeup rather than just having one guy come in to try to uh, fix the fences there because they could use another righty defenseman too, which Jason Demers is right-handed and Nicholas Chalmers is left-handed. So. Yeah, no, I hear you. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they do at the deadline. I-, I think, again, you're not too far out of a spot. I wouldn't sell the farm. And, I mean, I- I'd decide- try to stay competitive because if this thing changes, you're going to be back being a true contender. So if you add a piece or two here, I, I like bringing in veterans at this point, try to fix the locker room. If there's any issues fixed, obviously what's been struggling. 
I think that's the road I'd go, whether it's defense or a, a forward or something like that or center. I just think, again, this team's too good, and that, that change and switch is just too weird in, in, in itself, and whether you want to blame Cobra. And it is weird how it kind of all started when this team missed two weeks of the season and everything, so we'll see what happens. I think to kind of not make this one too much negative, let's, let's go to some positives, and, and I'll start. I think you mentioned him earlier in JVR. I think he's been one of my most impressive pieces of the season. I, I did not expect this kind of year from him. I mean, to be leading the team in points already, he's got a plus four point differential, gets a lot of minutes every game, and I mean, 13 goals, 18 assists. He, he's one of the better players so far on this season. I don't know who your kind of player of the year so far for this Flyers team has been, but I think uh, there's a couple guys you can go here that really haven't dropped off even through this stretch that continue to kind of try to help carry this team. Yeah, um, it's either JV or I would say um, the three people, like I said, that have been consistent all year with the JVR Coots and uh, Faraby, which at times were on the same line. Um, so I think uh, JVR has to be the guy if you're going to name a team MVP because he's played his best defense this year. Um, he's obviously leading the team in points, and he's looked efficient on both sides. He also has – he's tied for the lead in uh, games played uh, for the team this year as well. So – I think it would have to be JVR. The second guy, I think, would just have to be fair because Cooch, you expect to uh, have do really well at this point. Where Fairby, uh, you knew the signs were coming. You knew this guy was going to be a very good player. You drafted him 14 for a reason in 2018. Uh, you saw the signs in the smarts last year, but this year now the points are coming in bunches at only the age of 21, which I think is still – at almost a points per game at the age of 21 is a little bit ahead of where the Flyers had him clocked. So that's great to see. He's a good on both ends, can play on your power play and uh, penalty uh, kill as well. So I think it's uh, very good to see him performing like that. Um, Voracek hasn't been as good defensively this year, obviously, as he was last year, like a lot of guys having from the forward position. Offensively, though, he's still been solid, which is good for the Flyers because if he's a veteran they want to keep around, he's still producing enough to the capacity. He's very valuable to keep around, a very good guy to have in your locker room. Or if they eventually do want to retool and do some stuff in the offseason like they did in the past with the Richards and Carter deals, um, moving away a guy that is liked by a lot of people, uh, they could look to do that because his – his, um, production is still there enough to be able to move him. You might have to eat a little bit at 825, but not as much since he's still producing. Yeah, no, and and I think uh, I, I agree with you, and it's going to be interesting to see. And, I mean, as we continue this, I think it's just the state the Flyers are in kind of when you're struggling like this. Are you, I don't know, did you see A.V.'s uh, quote today on Carter Hart? Uh, I don't know if you saw that. For those who didn't, I'm going to read it real quick. As uh, Carter Hart, I mean, again, I know everyone's going to see this tomorrow after the Flyers-Sabres game, but today he was expected to start, but he was scratched uh, from the start this evening. And uh, A.V.'s exact quote was, quote, he needs to work harder, he needs to work better. I've had a good conversation with him but about my expectations, about practice habits, and him stopping the puck, end quote. I took that very interesting. I'm not going to lie, my eyes kind of widened a little bit when I saw that. I mean, he's kind of right out there in the media calling out Carter Hart. That's kind of a, a risky move sometimes with some younger guys to kind of see where he'll, he'll take it in terms of heart, especially if he is kind of having that downward spiral right now. That's going to even hurt his morale probably even a little more right now. So what do you make of that quote uh, as a whole in general? Um, I think it's just something to kind of get him going. I feel like it's one of those things along the lines of um, the Blues at the beginning of the season told Vince Dunn that he was on the trading block and then proceeded to two days later play in 22 minutes. <laughs> so um, I think it's one of those things that it's let's light a fire under this guy's rear end, and this might be a way to do it, because if you look at the other quotes coming out, it seems like this was almost planned by the Flyers, like have A-B, A.V. kind of be the go for the jugular dude. Then Ghost came in and said, I think Hartsey's going to be fine. He's just got to go find himself and find his game, which is a big part of sports people don't realize. It's as much mental as it is 
physical, no. he can do that, and we know he'll be back stronger. We're definitely not worried about Harshy at all. He's definitely going to be hard on himself. That's just the type of kid he is. He likes to compete, and he wants to be out there, so we know he's going to come back stronger. So I think they had everybody band together to help Carter here. I think um, it's just showing maybe the way in which he's doing stuff. They're saying try to adjust and do it a little bit differently. That works better to stay in tune for where you're at now in the pros, maybe compared to, I don't know, where you were in the minors and coming up in the juniors, such on and such forth. I don't know what the exact message is, but maybe it's like try to change up some of your routines so it kind of makes you more mentally prepared for this level compared to that level. It could be something as simple along those elk. And I think having this week off uh, will be very beneficial because, I mean, we've seen other players come back from time off, um, whether it's ending or in the league's uh, program they have for guys with uh, – that are having some issues. Bobby Ryan's coming back this year and having a good year. Um, or guys that just sit out from injury and it ends up being a blessing in disguise because they were struggling a bit and then come back and uh, do pretty successful. So uh, I think that's a guy, that's a thing that is big in hockey. So I feel like it's just going to come down to those things. But it's all going to depend for hard on what he spends this next week doing. And with the hard worker I know he is, I feel like he's going to – work on it and it's like ghost said it's one of those things we're going to worry about it now and then probably laugh about it almost which i think is what he was probably thinking in his mind while giving this quote a couple years down the line where i think it's going to be one of those things but the blessing in disguise is lyon did not play rob and i ran it about this on the disciples of ed did not play in 365 days and then they must have telepathically heard us because then the Flyers are like, oh, you know what would be a brilliant idea? He only played one period before the game got canceled in Lehigh Valley. Let's send Alex Lyon back down to the minors to play again. And it's like, mm. yeah, no kidding. Um, So they did that. He lost to Hershey, which was a weird game because they had no shots at the beginning. Then all of a sudden an onslaught came on later beat Binghampton in back-to-back -back games when he hasn't played back-to-back -back games in over a calendar year. So he looks like he's ready if you need him for a game. He beat Ca or Carolina, Colorado uh, for us last year when they were one of the hottest teams in hockey. He's also beat Boston in his career. He's played in the team's games in his career in the NHL. He's shown that he can uh, perform if needed, and on Wednesday they said it's either going to be Elliott again, which will probably be a big factor with how he does this evening, or Alex Lyon um, when it comes to Wednesday because they're trying to give Hart this whole week off, which I think is brilliant on their part to try to do it now, which they probably could have done it sooner. But doing it now still works because you got to take advantage. Hopefully Elliot and Lyon or Elliot and Elliot can win against Buffalo because you want a full Hart coming in loose, ready, uh, kind of – how he really works at everything, works on his body and mind to kind of loosen up again and not be in the mindset he's in now. Because you got the Islanders, Boston, Islanders, Boston. Then you got one game with Buffalo, Washington, Pittsburgh, Washington, Islanders. Like, that's all the way until the 18th of April. So you really need your goaltending and defense to step up when April hits. I think they're just trying to light a fire around the whole team where everyone on this team knows – the reason Hart's benched is also partially their fault. It's not that he's just struggling yeah. because of himself. It's because he's struggling because none of y'all can play defense this year. So if you start doing that better, you're not going to have to see a lot of guys get benched and come in and out of the lineup just to prove a point. Like we saw with TK, we've seen with uh, Albe Kubels of the world, we've seen with uh, San not Sanheim yet, Sanheim should have been benched at times, but hasn't. Uh, we've seen with Myers, we've seen with Ghost. So I think that's the big thing. You have to um, kind of play, and they're showing the guys you have to perform to stay in it. And if you're, and they're showing them this is also on you, but perform for your goaltender so this guy can kind of be the guy we expect him to be. No, yeah, I completely agree with you. And maybe it was a wake-up call for everyone, and that's why they're partially doing it as well. And you could be right, and hopefully that's the case because I did see a lot of players did rally behind them. So it's going to be interesting to see how they all take of it and, and what happens. I think uh, 
one final question to see to see this turnaround from this team. Obviously, we talked about the defense, and you might go with the defender. Well, I was going to say one final thing, though. I think on Hart, it's just impressive how much of a leader he's become so early in the locker room where not all young goalies would have their whole team, for the most part, kind of back them and say, yeah, we believe. Because it wasn't just Ghost. The other thing, other quotes you would see from G or others would be, we believe in Archie. He's going to be able to come back and be the guy we believe he could truly be. Um, I think that just goes to show the leader-esque ability he has in the locker room where it usually takes young guys, especially goaltenders, a little bit of time since they're trying to worry about the most important position in the game at a young age to kind of become the leaders in the locker room. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a fantastic uh, comment, and you're right. It does show what kind of leader he is and how – when the group does rally behind him, you see that. And that's something you don't see from younger guys. It's something you see about veterans and everything. So we'll see We'll see what happens. I think he, he's got the mentality to uh, really push push this team and kind of make that comeback. And like you said, hopefully that's what happens in this week. allows him to clear his head and get ready for this brutal schedule that's about to uh, come up here in the next, co- next uh, coming days. Yeah, I mean, no one else will end up winning against all these great teams. And then... Uh sucked in March against a schedule that was supposed to be much easier to win because that's just the logic of Philadelphia sports for you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about it. That's what, that's what all our Philadelphia team does. Beat the teams that you should, should, or should, shouldn't should beat and then lose the teams that you should beat. Just like the, that's why the Phillies missed the playoffs for you, because we couldn't beat the Marlins. Yeah. But, uh, no, yeah, I was going to say, uh, for one of my final points, I don't know about you, what your final point's going to be, but one guy I'd like to see kind of turn the corner here is Travis and I feel like his his game from uh, last year to this year has been a lot different, and I feel like it's kind of dropped a little bit. So we'll, we'll kind of see what happens. I mean, his uh, goal differential is negative 13, which is a very high number. I try not to look too much into that, but I think that does say a lot here. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if you agree or disagree with me, but I think it, for the defense, he's one guy that can really – if he could take his game to the next level, it'll, it'll bode well for this team. As my final yeah, thought. I think I think he and Myers, uh, who's been looking better the last couple games, as well as we're watching out of my side eye at the start of the game against Buffalo, he looks pretty decent. Um, I think uh, if he can improve, I think the benching helped Myers to clear his head. I'm surprised Sanheim hasn't been benched yet with the way that he's been struggling this year when other people have. I feel like if he continues to struggle, that will be something that happens. And then you'll see maybe for one game, Gus come back in with Myers. Um, I think it would have already happened if maybe a Hag was healthy. They would have just put Hag back in and had more defensive defense for that game and not as much guys that can hop up on the play. Um, but I think not having a guy that's as as defensive when your defense is struggling already kind of restrains them from wanting to bench Myers. That's that's kind of what I feel about that when he's struggling, where when Hag was healthy, they might be more prone to bench somebody, especially with how Moore and stepping up just go more defensive. But, yeah, they need the defense to step up, not just from the defensive position, but from the forward core backwards, unless if your name is uh, JVR, Coots, or uh, Fairby. Um, G's been better since coming back, which has actually been a pleasant surprise because G usually when he goes out – takes a bit to come back where with covid most guys in the league did not come back good immediately where claude Giroux, who usually takes a bit to come back came back like a firecracker so hopefully that can continue on the ice um for the flyers and then other guys can kind of pick it up that are not just from our first two lines and we can kind of get it going here because Hayes has gone cold recently on offense and he's been struggling defensively in general. So I would like to see him improve. But, yeah, the defense is really the final point plus the forward play improving uh, defensively as well. Um, that has been stressed this whole podcast because those are the biggest things we need to change. The goaltenders obviously need to improve in some capacity from how they've been playing now for Elliott now compared to the beginning of the season and for Hart throughout. But it's also... Your goaltender stats are prone to suck if your defense sucks at telling where somebody is, especially when they score seven goals in, six, like, seven periods. So, I mean, that's that's when you know your defense isn't playing well when one dude 
score seven goals in seven periods. So that they need to definitely improve that. So I think that's the biggest key for the Flyers going forward. Trade for defense. But also, if you're not going to put a Trewinsky or let a bottom in or somebody, um, Lazinski will fight a little bit, but him coming up doesn't really bring a guy that's going to be like a Barkley Goodrow like Tampa brought in or somebody like that or a Ross Johnson that the Islanders have. They need someone like Morin on defense who's already fought and got fined for what he did to Brendan Lemieux, which I was fine with just because he fought, someone finally stood up for their teammates, which this team is lack doing. You need to bring in def- or offensive forward, I think, that's similar to how the Tampa brought in Goodrow. You can't get him, obviously. That has some tenacity to his game. Uh, Fisher's a young guy that's struggling in Arizona. If you want to get a cheapy guy that has tenacity in his game, he's not as big of a guy, uh, but he's a guy that definitely has incentive to show more tenacity to prove he can stay in the league. He could maybe be a cheap guy you could pick up. Or with where Arizona is, you could simply, if you want to bring back your Energizer Bunny, Pitlick, that probably might not be overly difficult unless... If, excuse me, they, per some reports, have really fallen in love with him as a leader in their locker room. If that's the case, he might be hard to trade for. But with the way of just the way of the player he is as an energizer guy, you could probably give up a fourth or something for him. And then you bring back in a guy that's a good guy to show guys how to play for your team that I thought we should have never got rid of in the first place. But that's not here nor there. So. They lost a lot. They let some guys go that were good in their locker room, thinking young guys would replace them. Yeah. And that's also what screwed them this year. Albe Kubel, who I love, hasn't impressed me as much this year. He's another guy I would like to see. Had some better games in the last four, even through our struggles. He's looked solid in the last four, four checking and better. I need to see that continue because he's the guy I think they peg. He'll replace Pitlick. We don't need to keep Pitlick. In my opinion, just looking at the similarity of their two games, he hasn't done that, and I think that's what hurt them. He hasn't been as much of the energizer. Neither has TK, because both of their confidence has not been sky high this year. Where TK, in the last two weeks, now you see him chirping again, because he's had 15 points or whatever it is in the last two weeks through the struggles. So if Nat can get going again, you have a top-line guy and a bottom-line guy that piss off the other team. That has a big effect. That really helped the Flyers last year. Not having guys that really get in the other team's skin has screwed us this year, too. So hopefully our defense plus our tenacity improves because we've had guys get clocked and just done nothing about it this year. Yeah, no, I I agree with you. And sometimes it takes takes the uh, not most common guy to kind of step up there in that situation. And we've seen that in the past as well. So I don't know if you have any final thoughts. Or if not, just give us where people can find you in any other podcast, maybe. Um, yeah, well, I do a lot of stuff for SteelFlyers.com, which we started with Andrew's going to try when he finds the time to start our show on there and become a part of uh, the great SteelFlyers.com uh, community when he finds uh, his uh, time here, <laughs> uh, you know, time. Uh, time, but- yeah. Yeah, uh, then uh, obviously we have a Chasing the Pennant podcast uh, that Andrew... And I am on. I'm on the Disciples of Ed podcast with Rob and a Steve from Always Next Year podcast as well. And then also do some stuff for a Pub Sports Radio and Overtime Heroic. So check that out. Uh, for Twitter, that's usually the best place to find me, which is JJ Borick 26. But no, I don't have any final thoughts. We talked about it. Just improve the defense from forward to defense and show some more tenacity, like Morin has shown. And in the couple games, you're not going to keep this guy in because he has a short shelf life in the NHL. That Andreoff showed. You need to bring in a guy that has a long shelf life at forward that's going to stand up for guys or let the Trewinskis or some guys from the minors that maybe have fight uh, kind of fulfill that role. Uh, if you bring up Lozinski and he, he's been more of a skill guy as a six-rounder that shows a lot of forward-checking ability and tenacity, but more in a knack TK sense than a Barkley Goodrow fight sense. So I feel like you might need something like that. But the Flyers, if they can improve their defense, that's the first and foremost thing. Forward core will solve itself if you can just improve your defense through and through. I think once morality gets going in the right direction, guys will stick up for each other more anyway. So I feel like that's the biggest Achilles heel. If you can't get a forward, that's not going to bite you in the ass if you actually bring in a defense. 
Yeah. No, I agree. Hopefully you're able to take care of business against Buffalo here uh, these next couple of games and then kind of hopefully get some momentum there and build that little three, four-game win streak going into that tough stretch there in April to start the month uh, of that great month. So hopefully you kind of turn around and, and we'll see what happens. But that's this, and this is another episode of Grittiest Takes uh, with Joe and Andrew. So hopefully you guys like what you see. Don't forget click the subscribe and like button here or give us any feedback you might want to have us improve or just continue the show and talk about whatever t- great topics you guys want to give us. But again, for Joe and Andrew, thanks for watching. Grittiest takes. Have a great day.